Today, I'm down here at Max Motive in Cheswick, Pennsylvania to look at this fascinating 1957 Metropolitan. But before we take the tour, a little bit of background on what the Metropolitan was. If you stumbled upon this channel, I invite you to hit that subscribe button. While you're at it, might as well turn on all notifications too, because I'm really trying to get to a set schedule of postings, but I haven't gotten there yet. It's a me thing. But if you hit that bell, you will always know when there's a video drops. And trust me, there's some really cool, interesting stuff coming. You don't want to miss a video. All right, let's start the story where it starts. At the very beginning, in 1953, the Metropolitan was actually sold by Nash, and it was labeled the Nash Metropolitan. We're just going to call it Metro from now on, just to simplify things. Don't get confused with the International Metro delivery truck slash wagon. There were two totally different vehicles offered around the same time period. Things get a little bit confusing because in 1954, Nash and Hudson Motors merged to form American Motors. So in that time period, you could get a Nash Metropolitan or a Hudson Metropolitan, which were the same car. Then in 1957, AMC decided to drop both the Nash and the Hudson nameplates forever. They never appeared again, but made Metropolitan as its own make. After 57, they were sold at Rambler dealerships as well as AMC dealerships. The Metro was designed by William J. Flajoyle. If I pronounce his name wrong, I'm sorry. I'm a bit dyslexic, and I just suck at pronunciation sometimes. Anyway, they were offered in four series over the course of nine years from 1953 to 1962. Series one and series two cars were powered by a 1.2 liter inline four cylinder. It was an overhead valve design of an engine. It produced 39 brake horsepower at 4,300 RPMs. It was also found in the Morris Cowley, the Austin A40 Cambridge. The Series 3 and Series 4 cars got um, an updated version of that engine. It The engine grew to 1.5 liters, still overhead valve design. Power output was 40 brake horsepower at 4,000 RPMs. The 1.5 liter can be found in the Morris, Cowley, Austin, A50, and the MGA. You might be sitting there wondering, those are all British cars. Well, the fact is that this was actually made in, in England, and then it was imported to the U.S. for the U.S. market. We're not going to go over all the differences between the series because there are some differences, some changes between Series 1 to Series 2, Series 2 to Series 3, Series 3 to Series 4, because we're probably going to come back and hit those in another video. They're all going to get their own video one day. So we're only going to focus on the Series 3 cars and what makes them special. The Series 3 cars started production from November 28, 1955 until 1958. The Series 3 cars, most of them are two-tone color scheme with white being on the bottom and a white roof and then a color in between. To give you a gist of the size of the Metro, the wheelbase is only 85 inches long. The wheelbase is the measurement between the center of the front wheel to the center of the rear wheel. The space in between is called the wheelbase and that's only 85 inches long. Overall length of the car is 149 and a half inches long. It's 61 and a half inches wide, 54 and a half inches tall. Curb weight was roughly between 1,785 pounds to 1,890 pounds. Automotive journalists back in the day put this up against the Volkswagen Beetle. The wheelbase on the Metro is 10 and a half inches shorter than the Volkswagen Beetle. On the topic of automotive reviews, I found a couple really interesting reviews of this car. Um, we're gonna start with Tom McHale. He was like the Jeremy Clarkson or the Johnny Lieberman of his day. McHale was also the editor of Mechanics Illustrated. He said, better yet, he wrote, it's not a sports car by the weirdest torturing of the imagination. It's a fleet, sporty little bucket, which should prove just what the doctor ordered as a second car to take to the movies or to have a fun run at the penicillin festival. He also wrote about the handling of the car and that it had plenty of control and amazing dig considering the tiny Austin A40 engine. His 0-60 to 60 time, I don't know if he was going downhill because he got a way better 0-60 time than anybody else, was 19.3 seconds and could do just over 70 miles per hour flat out. Floyd Klamer was another automotive journalist, took several metros through his abusive tests. Klamer went into thinking that it was going to be a pile. 
and he got the shock of his life when it performed better than expectations. He also noted that he felt very safe in the car despite its size. Klamer took a 57 Metro on a 2,912-mile road test where he took it to the top of Pikes Peak, some 14,100 feet above sea level. He summed up his experience as a fascinating little car to drive and could not praise the car highly enough, performed better than one would expect and rides even better than that. Motor Trend did the economy testing where they got 39.4 miles per gallon at 45 miles per hour, 27.4 miles per gallon at 60, 30 miles per gallon in traffic. Road and Track did a 0 to 60 time of 22.4 seconds and compared it to the Volkswagen Beetle, which was a close competitor at the time. The Beetle's 0 to 60 time is 39.2 seconds. I could contest to that because I had a Carmen Ghia and they're very slow. But once you're there, it's nice. They get really good gas mileage. They also noted the Beetle would be at 3,000 RPM to the Metro's 4,300 RPM at 60. All right, getting under the hood. I believe this is the hood popper. This hood was already popped. I don't want to shut it and try to pop it again, just in case there's an issue with the latch. Just check this out. Look at that little tiny, that thing is tiny. Look at how much smaller it is compared to the hole of the engine bay that it sits in. That thing is tiny. I don't know how to convey that to you, how small this engine is. It's, it only looks like it's a foot and a half long. Maybe not even that. Subway sandwich might be bigger than that. Thing is tiny. So I just wanted to show you some really cool, unique features that you couldn't see in regular pictures. But notice the vent here. That's to blow cold, fresh air into the cabin. And it's not linear. It's got dimples in it for the windshield wipers, which is cool. Notice where they put the antenna over there. It's on the inside of the hump, so it's kind of like an angle. Also, look at how this door comes down. This is a three-piece back glass windshield. It almost looked like plexiglass, or not plexiglass, but that, like a convertible top glass. But it's not, it's, it's real. The other thing I never noticed about a Metro, they don't have a back trunk, or at least you can't get to it from out here there is one it's behind the seat in the back which we'll show you full size the spares mounted on the back here also the gas filler right here it's a very interesting little car also it would be really hard to change a tire because these aren't like skirts this is part of the body the front is the same way Notice there's a key lock right here on the door handle itself. Very basic door panel. There is no armrest where there would generally be one. Door handle here, window crank, no vent windows. And look at the shape of this window. It's angled here, but it's curved back here. I mean, Obviously, to meet the hole that it has to fill. It's curved back here. It's angled up here because there is no vent window. Okay, getting to the back seat in the Nash Metro, we're just going to... The seat just folds forward. They have, an actual, they have a book here of a place where you can get parts for this thing, which is really cool. The back seat is literally a seat cushion on a bench and the battery, which is almost bigger than the engine, believe it or not, sits back here for weight distribution, I would assume, plus there's probably, there is space up there, but I would assume it was for weight distribution. The way into the trunk is through here. There's a key that keeps this in place. And there is your trunk compartment. So that's what you get but it would be really hard to get in and out of back here. Also, 
Notice the hinges used. Those are almost hinges that I would use on my furniture. And this is just plywood. It's just a plywood back. Okay, moving on to the dashboard, all the buttons, switches, and knobs. This is very European. Nothing is labeled. Correction, next to nothing is labeled. Starting from the left to the right, choke. The heater control knob is very unique in the sense that you can pull it out and select either defrost or the floor, as well as turn it for the fan speed. Wipers is right to the right of that, and I'm pretty sure it's a two-speed wiper setup, but if I'm wrong, in the comment section below. Moving on to the steering wheel, notice the switch at the top of the steering wheel that is actually your turn signal indicator it is very unique moving past the steering wheel there is a single gauge cluster inside that gauge cluster sits the speedometer the fuel gauge is at the bottom and in the center is the odometer okay moving on to the gear selector it's a column shift three on the tree unit every single metro came with a manual transmission shifted this way Moving to the key switch, this key switch is very interesting. So you move it to the on position. To the left of the key switch, there is a lever. You pull the lever and that's how you start it. You have to have the clutch depressed, of course. Don't have to, but it would be safe. There's also a knob around the cylinder and those are the lights. Very interesting setup. Coming back to the center, there's two knobs. Those are for your radio controls. In the center, it looks like that is a heater vent, but that's actually the speaker vent. And then there's a cigarette lighter at the bottom there. Moving to the top of the dashboard, that's where the ashtray is found. This is your glove box situation. It literally is like a glove box. You can't really fit too much in there, but it is space that it takes up. It, it, it is surprisingly big for what it is. This is me sitting inside the Nash Metro. I have adequate headroom. The steering wheel isn't in your crotch. I mean, I had my hand. My, there's a lot of a lot of space. This is the view behind the wheel of the Nash Metro, and it's actually very cute. It feels bigger than it is. I love the fact that you can see the hood. You can see the end of the hood. I love the fact that you can see the fenders. It's really nice. This is what it looks like from my perspective of the Nash Metro. Okay, on to the pros and cons section. But before we get into the pros and cons, this is like the 50s, like the 1950s smart car. But in a lot of ways, it's more smart than the smart car. For one, you have a back seat, you have a trunk area. I'm not a big fan of the smart car. I would get this over the smart car. If you're looking at getting good gas mileage, the smart car to me should get like 60 or 75 miles to the gallon and it doesn't it's not very smart gets way less gas mileage than this i think it gets like 32 you could get like a honda civic from the 90s and have more power and more and drive faster and more fun than that car but that's it i'm not going to dwell on it so let's talk about the pros and cons i'm getting all the pros and cons from a book that i have it's called the complete book of collectible cars and the pros low buck collectible Still makes sense for around town use. It has a certain charm and it gets really good gas mileage. The cons, it rusts easily. It's unreliable Austin engine and it's got dumpy styles. Let me tell you. So when I sat in this car, I was, I was telling my wife, if I could find one of these for 800 bucks and it didn't run, I would put a Harley v, a v twin in it or a Hayabusa engine or something. I, I'm going to look for one of these. I might end up with one of them this summer. Who knows? But, um, but yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Until next time, toodaloo.